Hey, good morning, everybody. Well, you just missed it. I was trying to uh, catch the program so you could hear the chickens cluck and the roosters crow. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that was important. Yes, I have my goofy hat on. This is my working out in the garden. I had to get out in the garden first thing this morning uh, in order to beat the heat. And man, it has not worked. It's still early in the morning. And... Uh, yeah, it's still really hot. So I'm going to turn this around and uh, just kind of show you a little bit. Hi, Cassandra, what uh, we're doing. You know, we don't just want to share the gospel with you and share biblical principles, but we want to share our life with you, too. And I know we don't do that a lot. You know, I'm not the kind of guy and Linda definitely not the kind of gal that just wants to show you every nuance of what we're doing all the time. It's just not who we are. But but I would like to show you a little bit of what we're doing this morning before I get into uh, the scripture and talk a little bit about the Father this morning. So uh, it's one of my favorite subjects. Anyway, I'm going to turn the camera around. Don't freak out. All right. So this is the garden area, the chickens I was telling you about. It's kind of funny. Walk over to where the chicken area is. They have a tendency to all come running over here. Let's see if they do it. Hey, gals. Usually they, uh, well, now they're going to make me a liar, aren't they? Probably it's because I threw a branch in there earlier. Okay, so lost um, cell service there for a second. Uh, if that happens, please don't go. There's our ladies. They're laying us half a dozen new dozen eggs a day uh, anyway if you lose if I lose service on you don't hang up it should come back in just a second that's just kind of the nature of things when we're out walking around so little fenced in area that we have here little garden area we get a set and here's the where's she going hey Luce say hello to everybody Lucy say hello so this is not ours this is our daughter and son-in-law's dog. There's our little dog, Molly. Hey, guys. They always like to be close to us and uh, find what we're doing. They love the chickens. They love to be able to poke their uh, their beaks in through the fence and talk to the puppies. So this is what I'm working on this morning. I'll just take you a little tour. This thing, this is our little garden area. It was completely overgrown with weeds. And uh, a lot of stuff died because of the massive heat that had happened here in Texas. And, uh, of course, we were gone for quite a while, and it just got really overwhelming. But it's just uh, interesting how that the Lord uses the natural things of your life to talk to you. And so this garden looked, for all intents and purposes, really completely dead. But the truth is there's always life there. And I think that's a great illustration for us as people Sometimes we think that we're just too far gone and we've made too many mistakes and God isn't happy with us and blah, blah, blah. And it's all just lies of the devil. One of the things I put on the uh, program this morning was a prophetic word that I got from someone. It wasn't for me specifically, it's for a, a group. And you can actually sign up for it and see it. But anyway, uh, it talks about that lie and how that uh, shame can cover you and all of that. But there's life in you. You got to know. So I'm showing you right now. This is, believe it or not, okra. This is an okra plant. See right here? See that little guy right there? That's an okra. And you actually harvest them when they're only two or three inches. This is what happens if you don't harvest them. Okay, they get super huge and they go to seed. And I'm going to see if I can harvest the seeds out of them and grow new plants. But it's amazing to me once we cleared out all the dead stuff. And see, that's something you got to remember, too, about your life. Sometimes you got to get rid of the dead stuff, the stuff that's sucking life out of you that honestly just doesn't belong there. The Bible says that God is a pruner. It says he's like a husbandman that prunes us and takes away the dead stuff so we can grow. But sometimes we hang on to it, don't we? So these are, uh, I had a number of tomato plants in here. They've all kind of... Uh, disintegrated this one is a cherry tomato plant I don't know if you can see the cherry tomatoes in there but um, yeah there weren't any on just a few days ago so again just proof of life and uh, 
These are kind of funny. These are basil. I, I wouldn't call them a basil plant. They're more like a basil bush. They are. This is right up at my waist, believe it or not. This is like at my belt line. And these things had the hardest time getting started. But eventually, oops, I'm in the picture. Eventually, they just took off. And now I'm going to get starts off of them and try to plant some more. This uh, plant right here in front, I, don't, I really hadn't planned on showing you all my plants, but here we go. This plant here was an um, eggplant. And, uh, you know, something about eggplants, they're so big, I just didn't think this would actually grow. But sure enough, they did. We lost a bunch of them, but there's, again, they're still, I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's still some fresh life. See those little buds? Those are possible plants. And now this... Uh, this basil has gone to seed. See these sprouts as they come up at the top? Those are actually all seeds. So these are basil seeds. And um, and we'll be probably planting those too. And then there's a couple more tomato plants. And I'm going to take starts off. And then we're going to pull them up. We're actually going to make some beds here in the... Guys, don't eat the grass. You can't be that hungry. Jeez. <laughs> Anyway, um, we're going to be making some some raised beds to put in here because I think we can control the soil better, the weeds better, the uh, bugs better. Uh, right here in the middle of everything uh, is a lovely apple tree. kind of gets in the way. Now, um, Molly is examining the cacti. I'm not sure why you're examining the cactus. You're going to get prickled. But uh, this too, these little things on top are just absolutely brand new. And this is amazing to me. Here's another one. This is a green pepper plant, little green pepper coming out. It amazes me how that, again, I, I tend to draw illustrations out of everything, of course. That's life. I'm going to go ahead and turn this around now. Uh, you know, life really is about learning lessons. It's about learning the lessons of life. I think God created everything here on this earth to to give us messages, to say things. And I feel like this message this morning, part of it is that God hasn't given up on you. He hasn't given up on your your destiny or your progress. Come on, girls. Let's go. Molly, come on. <clears throat> he hasn't given up on who you are. He hasn't given up on your growth. He hasn't given up on your potential. Sometimes we do, and we get to feeling like everything is dead and nothing is ever going to work for us and blah, blah, blah. All the lies that the enemy tells us. i got to put this up on my mount. Sorry for it being so disheveled. And I look probably pretty disheveled too. But you need to realize that God is the life that's in you, in you, your very life. And I don't want to get too esoteric here or philosophical, but life comes from God. Satan, Satan doesn't do life. Satan does death. Satan does, you know, he takes life. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Okay, God is eternal. God is life. You have life in you. It's not, you know, even death itself, natural death is called an enemy. The Lord has every desire to keep you alive, there's my beloved back there. Wave your hands, Linda. Everyone can see you. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, there she goes. God has not given up on you yet, and he won't. He said, all that come to me, I shall in no wise cast out. He wants you to know that even though some of the things maybe that you do are not lovely things, that you are lovely in his sight. That's an important thing to remember. Why would he give up on you? Is it is it his desire that any person perish? You know, giving up on you is the... That was a mosquito, by the way. I'm not just freaking out. The only end result if God were to give up on you is hell. Death, hell, and the grave. That's it. That's it. Why would he do that? Why would he give up on you? Why would he do that? Oh, I'm just too bad. Really, you are worse than... The Apostle Paul that killed Christians, okay? You are worse than, than some of the men and women in the Bible that did horrifying things that the Lord saved. He, you know, saved from those things. He's not okay with those things. All right, anyway. His only, it says he's not willing that any should perish. Okay, he hasn't given up on you. He hasn't given up on your destiny. He hasn't given up on your heart. 
So something came to me this morning while I was in prayer before I went out to the garden to escape the heat, which I haven't escaped, um, is the idea of, of God. You know, we all know certain things, right? Um, if, if it's okay with you, <laughs> I'm sharing life with you. I'm taking off my boots, my mud boots, because I am sweating to death here. All right, I'm taking them off. <laughs> already took off my hat, now I'm taking off my boots. So we all know God is Father, right? We know that. Jesus prayed a very special prayer that introduced us in a brand new way, or maybe through gasoline on the fire of our heart of something we kind of sort of knew. When he prayed, our Father. I think if there's one thing that I could leave with you today, it is the phrase, our Father. I love that because he's not just saying my father. If he would have prayed to the Lord and said my father, then we could have, as we are accustomed to doing, looked for a way to believe that he that was just him and the Lord. That was him and that was the fellowship of the Trinity. And, and you know, I can't guarantee that he's my father and blah, blah, blah. All those things, it would have created an open door for the enemy to bring accusation against you. So he said, our, that single word, our, our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Now, many of you didn't have a good father. I had a imperfect father. <laughs> and I have been an imperfect father myself, okay? But my dad didn't know the Lord. And he was a very good provider. He was a hardworking man. I believe he did love all of his children, but he didn't know how to say it. And I've made it a point in my life to tell my kids I love them constantly because I want them to know. That's called learning from, you know, the stuff you went through. And uh, it's important that we don't blame everything that our mom and dad did for why, where we are today. Because even though we can get to a certain place because of the wrongdoing of others, God promises to give us grace to become who we were originally meant to be in spite of those things. And it happens when we get forgiven, and it happens when we forgive others, and then we move on. Um, I have no odd or bad feelings towards my dad at all, but in truth, he was he was not an affectionate father. He was not one that, uh, you know, was very touchy-feely or anything like that, but I know he cared for us. All right, so for the idea, of me, for, my, for me and my experience, as is some of yours, to come to God as my father uh, is uh, always a challenge. It's much less of a challenge now because I've done it so many times. And there is something to the phrase, practice makes perfect. It is true. Sometimes we avoid the hard things when going through them is the ticket to our deliverance. It really is. And we, you know, avoiding it is the last thing we want to do. Okay. Anyway, this morning, it had been a while. I, I tend to pray to Jesus a lot. Now, I don't want to get in Trinity, three in one. I believe that it's all manifestations of the self-same God. So I don't even want to go down that road. But what I do, same way as I come to the Lord as a bridegroom at times, I come to the Lord as a judge sometimes. I come to the Lord Jesus as a friend. I mean, all of these are attributes. We're sons, we're daughters, we're servants. We're brides, we're friends, we're all of those. Don't just pick one and go, I like that one the best. But embrace all of them. And the one that you're least familiar with is probably the one you need to lean into more than others. So those of you who may have had a bad father experience, that could likely be the one that you need to lean into. So anyway, this morning, I lean into that. I believe it's the job of the Holy Spirit to help us. I don't think I thought of that myself. <clears throat> so... In a practical way, when you talk to God, if you want to approach him as a father, you don't want to get a view of your natural father. You want to get a view of what he says he is as a father and address him like Jesus did in his prayer. He gave that prayer not as like just a temple. I mean, let me say it, not as just as a repetitious, you know, uh, a repetitive prayer that we just articulate and say the exact same words over and over. Although I want to be... The guy that tells you that is not bad if you do that. It's not bad. I know some people go crazy with that and go, oh, you should never say the Lord's Prayer. That's just vain repetition. Well, actually, vain repetition, the uh, 
the rabbis and, and uh, people in the Old Testament, they used to repeat phrases all the time. It wasn't any repetition. Okay, if there is such a thing as a vain or empty or useless repetition, then there is such thing as a good. If there were not two opposites, then they would just say repetition. Do not use repetition, period. That's not what he said. What is vain repetition? It's when your heart is no longer connected to it, and you're saying it because you think saying the right words is what's going to bring deliverance to you. Anybody out there? Say hello. Say amen. All right, so our Father, it is time to address Him as a father there are I should say there are times you need a dad okay I would love to have my dad I have dreams of my dad on occasions I would love to have just a little bit of time with him now that he's in a redeemed state which I am a hundred percent sure of my dad actually uh, was saved he spent his whole life not saved then he got saved on his deathbed and then the Lord gave us a dream where Jesus gave him a cup of cold water. And yeah, so I know for sure he's saved. I would love to be able to sit down with him right now and just talk to him and pick his brain about stuff and feel his affection. I would love to feel my dad's arms around me. And one day I'm going to get to, one day I'm going to be able to hug him and unabashedly tell him how much I love him and that stuff that was awkward before. All right, so. When you pray to God, when you come to God as a father, don't come to him as a dad that in your paradigm, you might have a good one and that would be all right, but your paradigm, if it's broken or if it was a negative one. So there's a couple of things about fathers that God is the perfection of, okay, of first of all, fatherly love. I think the picture I put on uh, Facebook this morning about this showed a picture of um, two uh, individuals standing under some blossoming, look like maybe cherry trees. One obviously is the dad and the other one is the, the son. And uh, I think they're both flexing their muscles. I'm not sure. I can't remember exactly what they're doing, but it was like father, like son. One of the things, one of the primary things, if not the primary thing, well, the primary thing is that God wants to demonstrate love to you. He wants to show you the level of love that he has, not only so you can receive his love and believe it, and you do have to take it by faith, but also so that you can demonstrate that same love. You know, a son or daughter who is loved by mom and dad will eventually show love to other people. No matter what they go through, uh, raise up a child in the way they go. They should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. It'll get in their DNA and so on. So he wants you to see that. He wants you to see what real love is. Real love is not just sex. Real love is not just people telling you how pretty you are or how good you are, or how talented you are. Or we worship you because you can sing good or play good or whatever. Love is love. You know, we have developed this phrase that's not a in the Bible, but it's a Bible, a Bible uh, principle, unconditional love. And what is that? That doesn't mean just that God doesn't care what you do. Okay, that's not what it means. Okay, any good parent cares what their kids do because they're trying to protect them, they're trying to guide them, they're trying to teach them, all of that. Okay, if you don't, I, I mean, if you're if you're the kind of parent that doesn't guide your kids to do right or wrong, you're condemning them. Okay, anyway, so every parent does that, but they want to demonstrate how they love their kid. They want their kid to love back. They're actually trying to teach them love if they're a decent parent, if they're a good parent. And that's the primary thing that God wants to do. He wants to demonstrate not only are you loved by him, and the word unconditional simply means he doesn't love you based on your condition. You get that? He doesn't love you because you're good, and he doesn't love you because you're bad, or you know, he doesn't love you based on any condition. Uh, let me illustrate it this way. When a baby comes out of the womb, I remember hearing one guy say it's kind of uh, it's a little bit crass and harsh, but I get what he what he was saying. Uh, he was some celebrity. He was on TV and he said within five minutes of my boy, my son, my child being born, I would have killed anybody on the planet for that child. Now, that's that's a little excessive, but you get the point. The point is there's something about your own birthing, your own child, your own prodigy that there's this immediate love there. You want to hold them. You want to protect them. That's unconditional. What do I mean? I mean, the kid hasn't done anything yet. The kid hasn't done good. They haven't done bad. They haven't done anything except be. And you love them 
enough to protect them at any cost. That's love that is not based on that other person's condition. That's what it means, unconditional love. So God wants to show that. The other thing God as a father does is he corrects. Now, this is the part we don't like. We would rather avoid correction now, or discipline or chastisement. Call it what you want. Okay, I don't like getting into semantics because I think after a while, people get words they don't like those words anymore. And so they make a new word that means the same thing. It's craziness. Anyway, God, as many as he loves, it says, I rebuke and chastise. Okay, every father that loves their child, it says, corrects them. If they don't, the child is, I won't use the B word, okay? Old King James is a B word, okay? You are a, in the, uh, in the other translation, it says you're illegitimate. So let's just use that. In other words, you're not really a kid. You're not really their son. They don't really care because you're not really their son. The nature of a true father-child relationship is correction to avoid correction is to avoid the most one of the most foundational issues it really is the a because it's actually not removed from love okay so we say that love is the foundational issue and then correction comes it comes out of that it is correction from the lord is actually because he loves okay now we don't do that well i've disciplined my children in the past out of anger okay out of a sense of, um, you know, being offended because they didn't, you know, and I don't mean all the time. I think the majority of the time my correction was love-based, but not always. We don't always do it right. You haven't either. Nobody does it perfect all the time. You'd be Jesus if you did, okay? But God does. I guarantee you when you're under the rod of correction, it is absolutely because he loves. And that doesn't make it unpainful. That's not a word. That doesn't make it fun. Okay, some people have the concept, anything that's God has got to be fun. It's got to be, ha, 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 No, God is a joyful God, and the fruit of the Spirit is joy. So he says, no uh, discipline, no correction, no chastisement, no rebuking, no reproving. Call it what you want. From the Lord is pleasant. I'm trying to remember what that says. I think it's in Hebrews. I might have put it down here on the uh, in the description column. I think it says, no chastisement for the moment seems joyful. Okay? Nobody goes, Dad, please, come, give me a spanking. I so look forward to that. <laughs> it is painful, right? But it is also, how can something painful be loving? How can, well, ask yourself that, Dad, Mom. Were you pained when you had to correct your, chil your children? Of course you were. If you're good, if you're not a sadist, sadist, however you say that. All right, so correction, big part of it. All right. But I like this third one, and that is reproduction and multiplication, guiding, conforming, transforming. I, I use that picture this morning because to me it speaks of what the Lord wants to do. He wants to help us grow up into his image. Okay, you're Jesus, and this is so harsh, and I'm going to close right here, but Jesus said uh, to some people once, you, you know, the loving Lamb of God that we love so much and we think never would say anything harsh to anybody, to a group of people, hi, Wendy. I'm sorry, I missed all of your names. I think I see Angie, Jean, Wendy, God bless you guys. Love you all. I'm sorry if I missed your name. But he said to some people, he says, you are of your father, the devil. Imagine, dear God, imagine the Lord looking at you and say, hey, you are of your father, the devil. I would die a thousand deaths, okay? <laughs> but I would be glad if he told me the truth and it helped me repent. Now, my point in that is there are two father figures. The enemy wants to conform you into his image. And he uses deception and lies and subtlety and he takes you in. He just pulls in little by little. I know it's become very unpopular to warn unpopular to warn people about getting involved in sinful ways. Okay? Very unpopular. You don't hear a lot of people talking about it. And usually if they do, they're kind of mean and foaming at the mouth and they're just angry people. Okay, there is a radical middle. I'm I'm trying for that, not saying I've got there. But listen, I've seen so many people that walk down the road to 
swallowing down iniquity, thinking that it was okay because everybody in the culture says it's okay or because they have this strong desire, you know, and then we wind up saying we're born that way and all of these lies and they wound up being bound. Now, my friend John Carney has a, wrote a book that's a really good book. It's about redemption and it's about uh, what iniquity means and how it means, you know, twisting and how God can, he was famous for saying, and he's still around, I'm not, he hasn't passed away, John, if you're watching, <laughs> I love you, about how God can redeem anything. And you know, it's so true. It doesn't matter how far gone a person might seem to be. It doesn't matter how deep in sin they may have fallen. Hi, Janelle. Nobody is irredeemable. Nobody is irredeemable. Nobody's life cannot be redeemed. I've seen some of the work, people you can't even imagine. I mean, so emaciated, so drug use. I mean, you uh, prostitutes, you can't even imagine how far gone they are and turn into flowered into beautiful human beings because of God. No one is past redeem, being redeemed. But listen to me. There's a flip side to that story. It doesn't take away from the redemption angle, but there is a flip side. Don't get started in the first place. You as a parent, those of you who are parents, okay, you don't teach your child, hey, you know, go ahead and go out, fall into sin, become an addict, a prostitute, whatever, you know, whatever. Be a liar, rob banks, kill people, whatever, because God can redeem anything. How foolish would that be? Now, for those who have gone down that road, Father God has that message for them, for the prodigals, for those who have lived in the pig pen. With tears in his eyes, he says, please come home. I can fix this. You and I, we can fix this together. Nothing is past being redeemed. But to his child who hasn't walked very far yet, you know what he says? Don't touch it in the first place. That's still a message. That's still a good message. Don't touch it in the first. Don't burden your life with going down that road in the first place. Listen to Papa God. He knows what's best. And, uh, and if you do blow, make a mistake, if you do blow it, if you do, I can bring you back. I can redeem you. So it might be a good day for you to bow your knees and to think. Don't just immediately start talking, but just think about your God in heaven. Like Jesus said, he's your father, my father. I didn't have a good father figure example while I was on the earth. He's a great one now. He's in heaven. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Okay, maybe that helps you to see your natural father, maybe it doesn't. But God is the perfection of fatherhood. Go to him, bow your heart before him. Think about who it is you're going to talk to. Weigh your words. Let your emotions flow freely. And talk to him as a perfect dad. You know, I'm a dad, and I'm going to end with this. I would never give up on my kids, never. I don't care if they were sitting in a jail cell on death row, I would not give up on them. It wouldn't matter to me. I would, I definitely wouldn't like whatever got them there for sure. And I do my best to try to help them not do it, but I will not let go of them. And that's, I think, the way a dad's supposed to be and a mom, okay? And it works for moms and dads both, okay? All right. He hasn't given up on you. He loves you and... All he's looking for is to love him back and trust him. So, All right, let's pray. Papa, thank you for your kids today. Thank you for their love for you. Lord, change our hearts. Only you, you said, can the leopard change its spots or the Ethiopian his skin? I, the Lord, try the hearts. Lord, you test our hearts. Show us. Change our hearts. Give us that heart of flesh you promised in your word. Write your law in our hearts. Help us to see you today in a new way as a good, good father. Bless your kids in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you just tuned in on and you didn't get to see the walkthrough uh, with our garden, I encourage you to do that. Sorry if I missed your name. Bless you guys. Love you all. And uh, good days are ahead. Bad days are ahead. Holy days, unholy days. Happy days. It's all coming down the pike. We need to walk close to Jesus. Keep your joy on. Keep your love on. Don't be moved by the winds. Jesus said that the storms will come. Build your house on 
hearing his word and doing it. That's what he said, right? He said, those who hear my word and do them, they're building their house on a rock. Those who just hear my word but don't do it, they're building it on the sand. Build your house on him today. Amen. He loves you so much. God bless you. I'm going to sign off. Oh, uh, last thing. If you haven't yet signed on to our Rumble account, please do so. Uh, we're getting restricted through other medias. Um, I don't want to say their, I'll use their initials, YT, okay, and FB. <laughs> we're getting a lot of clamp down and um, yeah, just not going to go there. So we'll still be on here as long as we can, but uh, we're opening up an account that I know will not do that to us. And that is Rumble. And so it would help us significantly. You don't have to not view the other ones or whatever, but go to Rumble, sign up, look for I think our call letters are Jim Moore 777. Pretty easy. One, all one word, all lowercase, Jim Moore 777. And uh, you should be able to find us. So God bless you guys. Love you. Give yourself permission to have a great day.